has is in progress. Um, and today I want to do a brief introduction to today's speakers. We have Jill Sen Center and Matt Thubod. They're going to be talking about educating parents to model AAC at home. A little bit different take than what we'll see in our next session because their focus is really very uh, research-based and very uh, structured and organized uh, about um, educating parents to model AAC at home. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves and I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Jill and Matthew. Hi, thanks so much. I'm Jill Center. And I'm Matthew Baud. And today we're going to be talking, as Gail talked about, educating parents to model AEC home and bringing that coaching into it a little bit. Um, and just so you guys do know, there is a handout. You guys have access to it as well. And But we also have a link to the handout that can be found under the presentation section of the free resources on our website. But just a note, if you're watching this component that you do need to register and it can take up to 20 minutes to get the automated email. Um, but don't forget to check your junk as well. Yes. Yeah, so S'mores is a registered trademark of Technology and Language Center. Just check with us if you want to use it. And here is some of the copyright information, just FYI, it's in the handout. I'm not going to read it by in detail today, but this is not a level training. And so for today, we have three expected outcomes for everyone that participants are going to be able to identify the benefits of communication partner instruction. We'll be able to talk about the benefits of providing modeling or partner augmented input and describe at least three key elements of successful communication partner instruction programs. So we got a lot packed for today. <laughs> we do, we do. Wow. Um, so just as a little introduction, I am the owner and director of Technology and Language Center PC. Um, we are a tele-AAC practice serving uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Washington at this time, Washington State. Um, and we do provide workshops um, on s'mores as well as direct communication partner instruction. As I already mentioned the trademark um, and we are receiving an honorarium for this presentation. I do not have any non-financial relationships to disclose. And I also have my own private practice that I provide all the coaching that we're going to talk about today. And I also am an assistant technology coordinator at Niles Township District for Special Education in the North Chicagoland area. Um, I do receive an honor for this presentation. I have no non-financials to disclose. Oh, and just so you know, um, if you feel like you want to reach out to us after uh, the session, if you have any questions, you can reach us in a number of different ways. We have a mailing list, we have our website, uh, Facebook and Twitter, just to name a few. And you'll get our emails at the end today. And so just looking at today's agenda, just so you know what's on the docket, we're going to talk about communication partner trainings in particular and the partners of communication partners. We're going to talk about that, those elements within parent training that are really necessary for bringing coaching home. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about partner augmented input and s'mores, and then we're going to get to a little case study for everyone to kind of practice some of the coaching that we're going to do, that we're preaching so much about. So let's start talking about communication partners, right? So we're all here today because a lot of us have students, clients, whatever it may be that are those AAC users, right? And so if we're really going to look at how to help them communicate, we know if we just give devices that they're not always going to be used at home. Sarah Douglas always talks about this idea that, you know, communication involves two or more people and both the individual using AAC as well as the communication partner need to adapt to the skills and needs of each other for that interaction to be successful. And that's what we're going to key in today about the successful interaction. And, and the importance of the communication partner. Um, you know, Kent Walsh and McNaughton have suggested that the success of a communication interaction between someone who uses AAC and a communication partner depends heavily on the skills of the partner. So uh, you all probably have experienced this uh, in your practices. 
right? You have a client, you have a student who uh, communicates really great in your sessions. And then they go out into the hallway and a peer asks them a question and the peer doesn't wait. And then the AAC communicator, you know, doesn't end up saying anything, um, right? That we know that the skills of the communication partner are so important um, in facilitating those successful communication interactions. Right, right. And just like Gail kind of alluded to that there is that we're going to talk a lot about some of the research out there because it's going to really drive what we're talking about. Right. Research out there. There's a lot of evidence starting to suggest that if we do train all of those very significant people in the lives of our AC users, whether it's the mom, the dad, the siblings, uh, we can look at the school side of things too, right? The teachers, the paraprofessionals, all those different related staff service. Well, it can be of great benefit in promoting greater participation in those daily interactions by people who use AEC systems, right? Because we're doing it within those natural everyday routines that happen for our, our AEC users. Yeah, and there have been a couple of meta-analyses recently, which are kind of the gold standard of studies, which show us uh, kind of com com combine <laughs> all of the previous studies that have been done in this area. And, you know, in their summary, uh, Kent Walsh et al. suggest that really we need to start thinking about communication partner instruction as an intervention for individuals with complex communication needs, right? This is not just something that we do as an aside, but this is actually an intervention because it has an effect on individuals who are using AAC. And you'll see that in a couple of slides coming up. But partner instruction really should be viewed as just an, this integral part of AAC assessment and intervention, right? Every time you're prescribing a communication device, you're providing one to a student. Um, those communication partners who are interacting with the student um, in the home really should have this instruction. I know Jill and I have talked about this a lot. And when we look at these, these interventions that we used to be so focusing on the intervention of the kid, the intervention, we're going to help that kid get better and better and better. But we really changed our mindset and the way we do our practices, you know, privately and even in the school system that, you know what, a big chunk of our focus is on this partner instruction, because that's the intervention we're really trying to hone in on. Yeah, so, SLPs, you probably have your students, what, maybe 30 minutes a week, 45, if you're lucky, 60, 90. Um, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what, what the families uh, spend with their kids. Right. And that's like that's why the big part of it, because so much of us have done the clinic-based you know, therapy is we're doing it outside of their everyday routines. And so that's why we know families struggle incorporating. So talking about today, we really do look at this idea of family-centered practice and that it's become that preferred practice in a lot of different programs. Whether we look at the medical model, the school model, and it does include those guys who have developmental disabilities. And most of the importance of this family sector's family-centered practice has been really acknowledged in the provision of AAC services. So that's how we're going to tie in what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And, you know, family-centered practice is a way of working with families to encourage parent participation and is characterized by recognizing family diversity, respecting families, treating them with dignity, sharing information, and really engaging in those parent professional collaborations. So therapists can help focus on family priorities and needs. And this quote really does kind of sum up what we're talking about and why it's so important. When we think about the primary interventionists in implementing AAC are often the parents, and the primary context for evaluating the effects of AAC inter intervention is the family. So parents and fam siblings are not only interventionists, but they are also important interaction partners of the child who requires AAC. So that quote just sums up, again, the family-centered practice, how we have to incorporate things that we just can't do the speech in our little bubble that we have to bring everyone in. And that's where we're seeing these positive, positive successful interactions as we move forward and train and coach our families. Right. And I mean, of course, we use the SMORS training program uh, for school staff as well. However, you guys know in your programs that there really is a lot of turnover. Family is forever. So 
we want to make sure that the family knows what they need to be doing with these devices. So it has been documented that mothers and fathers rate the need for increasing knowledge of assistive devices as a priority. They want that information. They want to learn more. And you know, Lisa has. Sorry, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I'm inspired to interrupt. I know that um, several of the folks on this call are working in early intervention or early childhood special education programs. Um, with kids who use augmented communication. And it's such a major function and major philosophy of those mm -hmm. programs. So it, um, it, that family focus is, um, is really important at that level. But I, sometimes I think when we get to school age, we say, oh, well, okay, we're done with that. And that, that's, a, um, in my mind, an error that we yeah. need to, Yes, correct. Yeah, well, th thanks for bringing that up, Gail. Um, and it does look like Alyssa has a message in the chat. Matt, you want to read that? Yeah, and it, Alyssa talks about this is where I'm really struggling. My main priority is getting school teams on board with partner strategies, but don't even know where to start involving families as well. My current starting point is empower the school based SLPs and educators with resources, info, and then create family trainings and support. And, you know, and we can talk, talk into this a little bit more and how we've done it, because you're right, it's a, it's a tricky slope on how do you bring families in because there are so many different you know, factors that come into play when you are a school-based environment. But what we have done is a lot of this, and Alyssa, you can reach out later, but we do family trainings and we, do, we call it parent academies that are just AAC related where we're still getting the same amount of information. We can't coach into their lives, but we do offer some support as much as we can um, with that piece of helping them incorporate. I know our early childhood programs, just like Gail said with their, the EI stuff, our EC, EC programs really do bring the parents in a lot and talk about it and have them practice the, the, the things that we do stress. But there are some ways that we can do it, but there's also barriers and blocks and why I think partnering and, and knowing the, the clinics out there and making sure they're doing some of the stuff that we know is the best practice. Yeah, and can I also just say that knowledge is not adequate knowing that modeling is important, knowing that utilizing the devices in the classroom or in home is, is not adequate. We have to get to, um, we have to get to application and problem solving, meaning um, people need to be so fluent in the device that it's like second nature. So we're gonna talk about how we get there um, and it does take time, but spoiler alert, the, the secret sauce on top of all these other ingredients is coaching. Yes, it is. So let's look at parent involvement in AC and look at this first bullet, right? Think about all those kids that maybe you know well before they got an AC system or how parents have talked about, like, I know what they're communicating, right? A lot of them do adapt a way to compensate for that child with complex communication needs. And Sarah Blux so really talks about this. Being an effective communication partner or AC facilitator is not intuitive. Right? It often requires one to change long established unconscious ways of communicating. And I think the more you guys work with those families, you know exactly they're saying this, like it's not easy. I've already created a way of doing yes, no questions to figure out what they really want, or I know how to read what this body part means and what this action and what this body language kind of components to. So it's really important, but we can even look at that second bullet, right? And those, those patterns in those communication partners that we see across every setting, whether it's school-based, it's home, clinic, that a lot of interaction patterns of communication observed in parents, as well as school-based providers, all right, of those children who use AEC are often these things, controlling the topic, dominating conversational terms, being more directive and inquiring those specific responses, tell me more, right? And the takeaway of all of those, and even though they've created some long ways of uh, some ways of communicating, sometimes those behaviors can really affect that development of communication and language skills. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that is really hard because once you've developed a habit or a pattern, then that's what takes time. And simply listening to a webinar isn't going to change that. So parent education is one method that we use to increase parent knowledge regarding children's SGDs. And basically, parent education, also known as parent training, 
broadly refers to training program designed to teach parents or inform them or teach them skills. So that's really what we're talking about. Right. And you really go back to Alyssa's comment. This is where we start making sure it's regularly scheduled parent program opportunities so that we can start giving them some knowledge about the basis. And so let's think about this and looking at the evidence out there and why do we spend that time? And if you're in a, the clinic based situation or school based, why are you going to spend this time doing some of these things? Well, if we do show the parents and explain it and give them some coaching, you're going to increase their satisfaction when clinicians recognize parent needs, right? If you know they have needs, there's always some satisf satisfaction by those families saying, yes, this has been good for me. Jill alluded to earlier about, you know, the intervention about training partners, not just the kids. Well, guess what? When we do spend that time training families and coaching them. Guess what? We also see the positive data outcomes on that AAC user. And there's a lot of studies on that. And we think about this positive change in children's communication. The more we train it, the more likely they're going to be more independent, right? Communicating on their own, talking about the topics that they want to talk about. Yeah. In our study and in others, uh, it increased family comfort level with operating the speech generating device and in supporting communication. And then the last study that we're going to talk about today is this one that was done by Kasari et al. in 2014. And it was a really interesting study where they looked at young children with autism participating in Jasper, which is a play-based child-directed um, intervention, which you might be familiar with, or you might know floor time or DIR, which is really similar. But when they, when they used a speech generating device in conjunction with this type of therapy, it resulted in improvement in spontaneous communicative utterances, novel words and comments, as well as joint attention. And I want to point out that that's whether the child touched the device or not. So simply from a parent modeling the device in the interactions while they were doing this play, um, they actually saw greater language outcomes. Mm -hmm. So when we think about training families, and I know this is how, you know, I've done it for years prior, especially prior to the research that we started doing was that, you know, you're in the clinic, you're at your house doing your own therapy, you're at their house. Sometimes those trainings happen really fast at the end of the sessions, right? After you got to work with the kid and sometimes parents are in there, sometimes they're out doing errands in the, in the middle of it, but, you know, doing those things right in the clinic room after talking really, really fast and maybe showing them how to program or, or add or give suggestions on how they can use it at home always aren't as impactful because that's not how they always interact with their, their kids, right? And so as a result, we have those problems that occur when families aren't really provided with ways to integrate it in those natural occurring activities. And that's what we always stress, right? You know, as a result, families, and we hear it all the time, see it as a burden as opposed to that tool that it can be you know, helping their child communicate and really increase that participation and engagement in their daily activities. So as a result, we get those negative family attitudes and the perceptions, and those do become barriers. And so AAC implementation, you know, and this stuff really do, this, these negative attitudes can lead to device abandonment. Yeah, I do want to say here, Matt, you can go to the next slide, but I did want to say that I think that, you know, we have a tendency and even some of the educational programs out there um, prescribe certain activities, like for example, storybook reading. Well, you know, we in our research found that not every family does storybook reading. And as a, as a matter of fact, some children actually had, you know, were found storybook reading aversive. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we want families to do what they're already doing at home because their days are already busy, right? They're driving kids to soccer, they're driving kids to therapies, um, you know, they're working hard. And so we want to make sure that they know how to use the communication device at their bedtime routine or um, when they're making a snack or things that are normally occurring at home. So. When we don't do that, as Matt said, we can get this abandonment. And just so that we're all on the same page, 
we're, you, we're thinking about abandonment here as those children who really do need AAC, but it, the use is discontinued. So let's think about the typical partner trainings and, and a lot of us do in-service and truly as part of a training program that, that in-service isn't a necessary element uh, of a training, right? Getting into the description, talking about it, but usually these sit down kind of in-service you know, trainings that we do provide. And sometimes like if you're in a clinic, like there are limitations if you can't push into their house or have them in your therapy sessions are where we might do a lot of talking, maybe show some videos, explain how to add some vocabulary. These are always aren't the most um, impactful in turning, helping these guys develop that the skills they need to actually use it at home. And so that's why Jill kind of talked about the whole idea of that secret sauce and coaching. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, how many of you are kind of geeking out about science and research like we are? Okay. Um, uh, we have done a lot of looking into the implementation science literature because what we found is that those implementation features, the practices that are used to train communication partners are just as important as the intervention features so for example, modeling partner augmented input, whatever our strategy is that we're going to use in establishing evidence-based practice. So in other words, how you teach is as important as what you teach. And Mortimer Alder talks about all genuine learning is active, not passive. So sometimes when we are those therapists those educators that we're working with families and we're giving them all this, you know, information, we're just kind of feeding it to them in a way we know our families or even school staff, whoever you're working with are going to have limited ability to actually talk about that information. Sometimes it's weeks later, sometimes the week later, you talk to a family, they're like, Oh yeah, I don't know how to do that. But then it's also when you talk through the families, they don't really know how to generalize and actually use it within those, as Jill talked about, those normal routine activities. We have kids that love the vacuum. We have kids that love at home, love to do certain things. And that's what we're trying to help them integrate that this information. And then just think about this. So we look at instructing these parents, siblings, right? I've been doing a lot of siblings lately because the power of that kind of close age peer is we really need to use a combination of training practices to really get those best results. So why we always stress the research because it guides us, right? It gives us that, that baseline of what we need to do and we can bring that into actual functionality because we know that Darling Hammond talks about teaching is not talking and learning is not listening. So we have to bring in, yes, we need to give them what the what behind something, the why, the how, we need to show videos. We also know how to make it active so they're using it in their everyday routine. Some other things that we know is that parent education programs are of greater benefit when parents practice skills they learn on their own children. You know, I mean, there's so many things that seem like common sense, but they're also, there's evidence to support that. So, you know, having parents do um, controlled practice opportunities are important, but then we need to move to doing things with their own children, not just simulated conditions. Training is most effective when it's implemented in everyday meaningful routines and activities, right? We've said that I think like five times so far, we're just going to reinforce that with these studies here. And the use of parent coaching, which is that live observation and feedback in the natural environment is particularly important in interventions with children with complex communication needs. Uh -huh. Yes. So when we talk about coaching, I want to make sure that we're on the same page because we see samples, you know, on the, on the interwebs of of different types of coaching. When we're talking about coaching, we're referring to side-by-side, -side, otherwise known as in vivo coaching, right? This in vivo coaching allows communication partners to receive live feedback specific to the accuracy of their implementation of new behaviors. So the new behaviors that we're working on include modeling AAC. That's what the S'mores uh, protocol, uh, S'mores training program is based on. In addition, side-by-side -side coaching allows communication partners an opportunity to observe 
uh, specific procedures demonstrated by an expert. In other words, the coach with their children in the context of real activities. So during side-by-side -side coaching session, the coach directly intervenes in the session, right? Um, provides a model and a rationale for the change, and then provides additional opportunities for the partner to try the same strategy within the same session immediately. So coaching and collaboration our coaching requires collaboration, but the, the, the things that we really want to highlight about coaching is that in coaching, the child is there. It occurs in naturally occurring routines and activities. It occurs in the natural environment and the coach provides immediate feedback, right? You guys probably um, already do a lot of collaboration. Some of you might be doing coaching. Ashley, how many of you, let's take, uh, you can use your little emojis uh, and show, show of hands. How many of you are already doing coaching or some of you, have, you already have a coach uh, in your school program? Shani, you got one there, Deb, Bill Kim. Okay, a few. Yeah, good. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, we're get, getting some more. That's so, in the chat window. You know, yep. it, and, and we want to think about this coaching is different from, you know, just adults communicating while the child does something else. Like Matt was saying before, after a session, you know, you're talking to mom for a few minutes or you're having a Zoom with mom or you're doing a phone conversation with mom outside of the actual session or doing it later on, not immediately. So, um, you know, both coaching and collaboration are relationships between equals where both partners can express point of views and choices are made collaboratively, but coaching really needs to be in that natural environment. It needs to be live in vivo. Right. And this is something that really guides us on, on our training program. Kaiser and Wright talked about to really adequately support a child who is using an AAC system the communication partners have to have skills in three different areas, right? Communication mode, understanding what the vocabulary system is, what it is about, how to use it, strategies to respond to the child's communication, all the different attempts, whether it's on the device, it's the nonverbals that they're using, as well as strategies for modeling. And we look at what our research really did when we talked about bringing the most Morris training program, it focused on modeling, right? That number three, but in doing so and doing the coaching, Though, and when they're actually doing it, the increase of communication mode. We always have families and, and, and school staff say, now I understand the device more. And they always have ways of responding to all of the children's the, uh, attempts for communication. Right. By focusing on modeling, we get to the first two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the strategy for modeling that you might be familiar with is partner augmented input. It goes by lots of names, but it all refers to the same thing. So aided language modeling, aided language stimulation, natural aided language, all the same as partner augmented input. Um, and so Alan et al. defined augmented input as an umbrella term for systematic modeling input from two or more modalities one of which must include the learner's AAC system. So this usually is talking and then pointing to pictures on the student's communication device or on the child's communication device, but it can be more. Um, if the child is learning sign language, it can be uh, talking and signing and pointing at the same time. So basically it's like a total communication uh, environment. And there's quite a bit of research on partner augmented input. Uh, number one, we know that it increases vocabulary comprehension. So simply understanding the meaning of spoken words um, is, is a huge thing. And when we model things in context, kids begin to learn concepts, basic concepts like, oh, I want the big ball. Oh, the little ball. Um, that helps them start to understand some of the actual language, but it also increases symbol comprehension and production. So 
uh, not only does our modeling help kids understand what that icon means, but it also increases their use of it. So simply modeling when you're playing will actually get the child to be communicating using the communication device. It increases production of multi-symbol messages. It increases the use of morphemes such as past tense ed, walked, or plural s, sees, uh, sorry, <laughs> seeds, um, and increases utterance length and complexity. So again, uh, a few meta-analyses that have been done, those gold standard of studies that look at the whole body of research on par uh, partner augmented input, and they found that it's associated with gains in pragmatics or increases in social skills, semantics and or word knowledge, syntax or sentence formation, and morphology, those grammatical uh, word endings. And it meets the criteria to be considered evidence-based. So this is our what we teach, right? We talked about how we teach is as important as what we teach. This is the what we teach when we do SMORTS. We teach modeling on the communication device. So how do we actually provide this modeling, right? Well, those communication partners, parents, the school staff, peers, siblings, whoever it may be, will select one or more keywords from that spoken message on the communication system, the device, whatever it might be. And it can be before, it can be during, or it can be after. But it's always within the context of these naturalistic interactions, play routine, you know, play routines, whatever it might be in the house. Um, we just always stress this. We just remember by definition, PI just means you have to do two modalities. It has to be talking plus the pointing on that system. We want both. Yeah. So in 2005, Kent Walsh and McNaughton proposed an eight-step instruction model for use with communication partners of people who use AAC. And the reason why they did this is because they really wanted to focus on instructional me methods that were associated with success and evidence-based procedures, right? And I think that that's really important because there are so many programs out there. And um, what we find is that um, we know that multiple training elements, including coaching, is really the key to success here. So um, Matt is going to talk about the eight steps. There we go. Right. So you can't quick, watch me. Sorry, I have a quick back. question. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah sorry to interrupt. So, uh, you know, one of the tried and true things I hear from parents is, and I work with early interventions, so little littles yep. uh, early on in the process. And, you know, the concern that I want my child to learn how to talk and the old go-to of, of the fear and worry that this will inhibit that. And I don't know if you guys have a, a, a script that you is your go-to or if there's that handy, a parent-friendly flyer that's, you know, on their website or, you know, something along those lines would be we, a great we resource. Do. We do. Um, so we actually have several free resources. I know we gave you the um, the link at the beginning. Um, I don't think it is in your handout, um, but um, our free resources page on our website, we'll pop it up at the end again, um, has lots of free resources, including parent hand. There's a whole section on parent handouts. So we have a partner augmented input. Uh, handout that is in both English and in Spanish uh, for free download on the website that might be uh, helpful. Um, but um, yeah, there are lots of other uh, free resources there that uh, you are able to take advantage of. And for when the parents talk about the whole talking versus not and et cetera, that the concerns are, I do usually send them to the stuff that's out there, whether it's Toby Dynavox, Saltillo, a lot of them have those resources already pre-made. So I just usually send that to them for those components, but it always still is a, a thing we hear. But I think when we always talk about bringing it back to the communication AC, we try to tie it that way. And so with the partner training part of it, you know, we really do talk about these eight steps that Kent Walsh and, and would not say. And so this is how we incorporate all of our sessions, whether it's 
in the clinic, it's in the school system, whatever it might be. Is number one is that pre-test commitment, right? That's that baseline. I love baseline videos of parents showing really what's happening in that activity. And I'm going to tell you, the more I work with families, like I got five or 10 minutes to play with this child. And that's the piece. We want to see what's going on. Like what's the everyday activity? Like sometimes it's a dad recently was a dad playing Fortnite. And I'm like, Oh, I'm not sure how that's going to work. But the dynamic between the kid and the dad during the Fortnite video was phenomenal. It's just like so much language available. So we want that baseline as well as a commitment like, hey, you're committed to doing this and we want to know what are your goals. That step two is strategy description, right? The really quick, the what, the why, the how. We want families to know what it is. We also want them to know the little why we're doing it because sometimes we won't do something if there's not a why behind it. And we'll talk about that how. This step three happens in different ways. Strategy demonstration, right? This is going to be when you're doing the in-service part, you're showing videos of what it can look like in the home. You can show videos of what it looks like in the classroom. You can show videos of the specific skills just to help families isolate. How do I do this idea of respect and reflect? But also strategy demonstration happens live. So if you're in a clinic, they're going to be within your sessions. And let's say a family says, I love dodgeball. I'm not going to lie. That actually happened. They play dodgeball regularly with the siblings. And so that's where we did it. We modeled it within it. So it was me, the coach, demonstrating the modeling within that activity. Uh, so we do it that piece. Verbal practice. This is where it goes into s'mores, right? It's a, a, a mnemonic to help them always remember those cre key elements, those critical skills that they need to do when they're providing model, but also a way to rehearse through it so we can see where families might struggle in understanding because you're like, all right, talk to me about what's parallel talk so you can help them kind of guide them. Control practice is step five. And again, we do this in different ways. We do it within our end service. Hey guys, let's practice doing this modeling, parallel talk, self-talk, expansion. We do it really in a very controlled way, but we also do it live within the session. So that's where we're gonna provide that support. We might bounce back, do some strategy demonstration, do a little practice, kind of guide them and prompt them through, you know, how they can use it while they're playing Fortnite. Advanced practice, step six, we step back. And that seven, eight are just critical because it just shows you, like, it's that post that's like, wow, look at the change from that baseline video to this. And of course, we always tell them, let's pick another activity, see how it generalizes to the next step. But they're all critical. And so when we look at a lot of different training programs out there, um, you know, the s'more training program is based on the uh, aforementioned eight-step instructional model. But a lot of it, what we started doing is like, we want to make sure it's about those everyday occurring activities in the classroom home, not just maybe shared book reading that we see in the, the research a lot, you know, and we really want to also look at, let's talk about focusing on just modeling because there are other techniques we can work on. And we also want to make sure it's about that current device, right? If you do look into research, sometimes it's a very activity-based controlled board for the research topic. So ours is more about that, which we're really critical for. Yeah, so this is just a graphic kind of showing the um, all of the different branches that came off of the Kent Walsh and McNaughton 2005 study, but that also Kent Walsh and McNaughton borrowed the eight-step instructional model from Ellison All in 1991. So, you know, when you're looking for evidence-based research, you're looking for uh, and training programs, you're looking for things that gradually change incrementally over time. And so all of these programs um, have the same eight steps, but what they're focusing on is different. So S'mores focuses, as Matt said, on partner augmented input. And, you know, our real goal um, I was, we were talking with Gail about this uh, before all of you guys hopped on, is to really bridge the gap between research and practice. Because what we know is that there is a gap between what is known to be an effective practice, in other words, the theory and science, and what is actually done, our policy and practices, right? Um, there's evidence to suggest that the lag time between research and science and, and, and practice is about eight, uh, 17 years on average, on average. So that's about how old the Kent Walsh and McNaughton program is. Yet 
we routinely go into classrooms and clinics where those one-time in-services are still happening. So, so really, you know, despite the fact that we know that those multiple training elements are required, it's still not widely done. I know a lot of people always say about that, the research versus practices. Sometimes people say that the research is not practical. And I think that's where we really try to bridge that gap. And a lot of times we'll run into people like, hey, I know all about s'mores now, right? They've heard it. But what we always try to stress to them, like, all right, s'mores is mnemonic. Really, it's just one really small part of our training program because, yes, we need the s'mores. It helps us remember those key elements in the modeling, right? So that's a part of it. But when we talk about s'mores, what we always do stress with teams and the therapists out there, why it's so important. It's just not this word model, right? What I think we always felt like before is like model is very generic and doesn't have a specific because the word modeling means different things to different professions. It means different things to speech paths among speech paths, right? Some of us have learned modeling in terms of the Arctic, which is much different than the model we, we talk about with AAC. So when we look at at s'mores, right? Each letter of s'mores, that, that different part of it is the operational definition of modeling. And each of those components have the evidence base behind them. So we can look at the MO, right? Which has self-talk and parallel talk. We can look at the E for expansion, the S for stop and wait. So each of them have those key evidence-based practices that we know in terms of facilitating language. Right, there's a whole body of evidence just on expectant pausing right? But we're putting it all together into s'mores. So let's talk a little bit about some of the evidence uh, that we collected about using s'mores at home, okay? There's additional evidence that we are not going to have time to go into today about school staff, but that is on our website as well. But um, if you click the bit.ly link in your handout, um, this will take you to a copy of a free article on our website. Again, if you get super excited about research like I do um, and you want the original study, um, it is open source and it is available on the S'mores page of our website. But um, let's talk a little bit about what we found in this study. Basically, let's uh, just look at the graph on the right here, because I don't even need to go into all of the statistical jargon here. Um, you can see that at pretest one and pretest two, families were not using any modeling on the communication device or were using very little. Okay. But then when we got to the post tests, uh, both post tests, we saw that there was a nice jump in parents using modeling. So the s'mores training program increased the use of modeling between pretest and post-test. Well, the thing that was kind of nice to note there is that the data that we got from that, right, right we can look at parents' models produced at post-test were analyzed to determine the percentage of unique words model. So basically what that showed us was that they weren't just using those simple stereotype phrases, right? They were using a lot of variety in there or just not program phrases. So we had some good variety there. And um, we saw that three of the four children increased their use of unique words. Now we didn't have a ton of statistical power with only four subjects, but um, you can see that the subjects that did increase the number of words that they used increased pretty substantially. So, for example, if you look at our uh, participant one, um, at the pretest, he only used uh, 10 words. It was like more, go. But then at his post test, he used 37 different words on his speech generating device. That was a pretty big bump just as a result of his mother modeling for him. We also did some social validity to kind of just to look at um, what some of the families were thinking about. We had different questions, including things like, overall, I believe that PAI has been effective in supporting my child's communication. I use my child's SGD more frequently at home. Things that we always ask, and again, feedback, if you do this privately or in your clinic is really good to hear. We did a Liker type scale just to kind of see where, where they're at. And some of them are changes in their self that we looked at. So some of the questions that we asked um, were things like, you know, I thought that this training was helpful. I use this device more at home. 
Um, you know, I'd like other family members to be trained. And so, um, you know, I, I love some of the parents self-identifying or using reflection to see what they changed in themselves, you know, um, using the respect and reflection option more. I believe I communicated better with my child when I took that into consideration. We had great language exchanges and then often led back to the task we were targeting, but sometimes it didn't, right? Sometimes it went off topic and the conversations we had were very informative and covered ideas and topics that hadn't been talked about much in the past. I had much better proficiency using the device. Remember we were talking about comfort level using the device? Simply by training modeling, parents also became more comfortable in using the device. I'm more confident in using the device, right? There's another one. And not just requesting. So using it for multiple communicative functions. Changes I started to make and need to continue to work on is providing my son with more opportunities to communicate. Over the years, I've gotten so used to speaking for him and asking yes, no questions and figuring out what he needs without talking, that it's a change of mindset that I need to work on. Oh my gosh, right? It is. It's such a hard change. He has so much he can say and knows he can use his device, but it's about breaking the barrier and having him actually use it. We also looked at changes in the child. And I think some of these comments, we read through them. This is what we see when we do it in the schools. This is what we see families say all the time. And right, and they, this one is that my child is taking the model in his own way. It might not always look like he's watching or learning, but he is. And it just make him take some time for it to show itself. So they understand that it, it, it could take some time. They feel way more comfortable using the device, right? And then we'll get that as a common theme, getting more comfortable using his talker and he's using it more and more as time goes on. Again, our goal, increasing it across those other activities. Also like this last one, I've noticed that if I give my son the opportunity with longer pauses and not providing yes, no questions, he tends to use his device more. So go back to those those behaviors that we do know untrained partners use, like dominating the topic, and they find their own intuitive way to use, you know, communication. Well, that's where we see them increase a little bit. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Um, and then just really quickly, you know, parents really liked the idea of coaching. They liked that it was hands-on. They thought it was thorough. Um, that there, that we broke down the steps of using the device that we had, the S, the M, O, the R, R, E, S, and they liked the feedback. You know, this, I think really hits home And this mom said, the training was very good before the study. I knew we needed to model, right? She had the knowledge, but what she didn't have was application and problem solving, right? She didn't get to that level where she could integrate it. And the other thing that I think is so important is that they focus so much on modeling that they didn't pause and let him take a turn. <laughs> so, so, you know, the reason why we model is so that our children can begin to use their devices more and communicate more and hopefully also increase verbal um, as is demonstrated in the literature. So in summary, right, that we saw, and this is, again, I bet you Jill will say, I see in my private practice, the more that we do this, right, the more that parents actually demonstrate the ability, the ability to perform all those components of successful modeling, whether all those different letters of s'mores. And parents increase also the percentage of utterances modeled on their SUG between pre-test and post-test. And that whole pre-test and post-test so critical for you guys and therapists and, and using the power of video, right? Whether, you know, having those families use those natural routines at home and videotaping them is really where you're going to get that buy-in actually successful use. Now, the other thing I love seeing, like we talked about a little bit before, percentage of unique words modeled increase. So again, they just weren't doing the same phrase over and over. And of course, the best part is that three out of the four kids demonstrate increase of their own unique words following partner instructions. So as we talked about before, we know the literature tells us if we train partners, we have positive outcomes on kids. That's what we see. And again, you know, subjectively what we see with our, our families doing the same thing, the more we spend the, the resource of them doing it within our sessions and doing some videotapes, the more we actually see them using the device at home, which is our main goal. Woo, 
Okay. Oh, I want to thank our students, by the way, who participated in this family research study. Uh, Brianne, Jasmine, and Emma, um, they were so fabulous, as well mm -hmm. as Midwestern University for the grant that they provided. So, so go questions. ahead. Questions. Yeah. Discussion. So, you're thinking about. Yeah. So now is the time for discussion, and we can answer some of the questions maybe that we didn't get to yet. You can either write them in the chat or go ahead and unmute. But we're going to start off while you're writing your questions with a reflection. There. So just thinking about, right, we know with coaching and why we always we stress is that reflection is one really critical component about coaching. So let's just start our discussion with some more reflection. Think about the stuff you heard about today and then going through it. What are things that you might stop doing, things that you're going to refine that you're starting to do in, in your, some of your own practices and things that you're going to start doing now that you haven't before? So you can take those moments, think about it, reflect on it a little bit. Yeah. And if you're currently training families, what methods are you currently using? Um, would love to hear about that. So Matt, you want to stop share so maybe people can uh, pull Everybody up their video can. so that they can participate in the discussion. So anyone want to share things that they want to stop, refine, or start doing? I was thinking about the term modeling and how we use it over and over, but like you said, people don't know specifically what that means. So I might may stop using the term modeling, start using more descriptive language and refine my practices around how I explain modeling to my teams. Great to hear. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? I think I will um, try to break it down modeling a little bit more for um, some families, especially who culturally have different interaction styles. Yes. I, think, yes. um, I really have to separate self-talk, talk about what the child is doing, talk that's about what the child's body language is communicating, talk about what the child is hearing. All those things are, are really different and separate for some families who don't have um, Western American um, parent-child yeah. interaction. And I, and I think even for families that do, you know, what we find is that um, there's been such an emphasis on the child touching the device that there always seems to be this kind of man model or they want to gesture to the device and have the child touch it and not themselves. And so it's just can be a really big mindset shift for all families and, and frankly, for all communication partners, including school staff, et cetera, to, to use the device yourself. And when we break it down in the operational definition, it really does help families to be able to think about, okay, now I'm going to work on an expectant pause. Let's just stop and see if our child takes a turn. Okay. Looks like some other people have shown themselves. Uh, anybody else have something? Uh, Mallory or Alyssa? Um, I'm an early intervention teacher, so I do only parent coaching. I do home visiting. Awesome. Um, and one thing that I am trying to get away from um, um, that kind of is reflective of what you guys are talking about um, is hopeful modeling. So um, I found like early in my practices, I did a lot of like modeling at my home visits, hoping that when I left the parent would do it, um, but actually having them actively participate and try it out while I'm there so that I can give them feedback and support them through that is um, what's helping with follow through. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, we hear that a lot in the schools. Oh, but I model in the classroom when the instructional assistant is there. So, you know, by osmosis, this person should, you know, be able to do that. But we really do need that coaching aspect. So let's take one more because we do have a case study and I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I think for me, that distinction between coaching and collaboration is so, was really like light bulb moment for me. I didn't really think about that, um, especially because when I'm working at the district level, I'm getting called in to go support 
school A or school B or school C, and I'm not necessarily doing that follow through yet. I mean, I've only been in this position for like six weeks, so there's definitely room for me to grow um, in incorporating more of that coaching because I, I do see how the collaboration is going to go nowhere unless the coaching happens, but then also recognizing that that collaboration has to happen because that's the first conversation I'm having with teams is figuring out where they're at, what are they already doing, and it's so varied, so varied just amongst the teams that I'm working with now. Like some have are completely overwhelmed. This is their first year as a special educator. They don't even know what a AC is or stands for versus another school who's like already putting visuals all over the room and, and adapting reading instruction using visuals. And so like that has to happen first, but that's really important for me to think about is moving forward. I have to incorporate that coaching. So and that's the best part of a coach right there. I think yeah. we could spend a whole hour, two or three hours just on that stuff itself that mm-hmm. just being a good listener. Right. And it's like, same thing. There's times I don't go to coaching. It's more collaborative or it's just more relationship, relationship building. I'll just build mm-hmm. that rapport because I want that person to trust me and know me that I am just a human. This is not me telling you, this is a partnership. So mm-hmm. like you said, we can talk a lot. If anyone's going to ASHA, we're going to talk a little bit more about this at ASHA in about what, five, four weeks. So we can talk more about that as well. Yeah. And I see some uh, others in the chat. Please do keep ch- typing in the chat. I see some people are going to be using reflection more. Some people are going to do a little bit more coaching. So our case study uh, portion of our presentation today is a five-year-old female. She uses a Nova Chat 10 with Word Power 42 Basic, and she's used this device for more than two years. The core family leisure activity that they've selected is game playing. That's something that happens often at home. And uh, the parent that's participating in in the parent ed is a mother. So let's go ahead and watch the pretest. Um, since we're running short on time, you guys want to just start typing things in the chat that you're seeing. I will ask that you be respectful. Um, you know, we know that communication partners adapt in ways that may not be conducive to communication, but we want to point things out so we know what we might need to shift um, in the family. So just point out, point out some of the interaction uh, things that they're doing. Um, and if you want to go further, also just kind of type in, what would you want them to do instead? You know, what would you want to coach them on? Okay, put it in. We got to start playing our game. Okay. Now, can you find me a red one? Yeah. Find me a red. Very good. Tell me red. Very good. Can you tell me red on here? Okay, put it in. When we play our game, do you want to do, do you want yellow or red? Yeah. Tell me on here. Yellow or red? Show me. Show me on here. Tell me on your talker, what color? Yellow or red? Which one do you want to be? Okay, you be red. Okay, I'm going to turn it on. Okay, Okay, so... Uh, what were some of the things? Uh, okay, be careful of teaching, uh, testing versus teaching. The show me. Yes. Uh huh. So you want this child to do respect and reflect, right? This child's already communicating in such fabulous ways, folding up the the wand and vocalizing, and so we know that means red. Let's respect and reflect that one. Nice. Um, right. This parent was very directive. Again, a natural accommodation, you know, requiring specific responses, like tell me red, tell me yellow. Anything else? Anybody see any modeling? Did mom touch the device? No, right? So there wasn't any modeling. Um, Anything else? Okay, well, in our remaining three minutes, let's go ahead and let's watch the post test. And I really want you to comment on some of the things uh, that you see that have changed um, between pre and post test. Do you want to play? 
Do you want to play? Mm -hmm. The fishy game isn't on here, but we'll just say. No, game. Do you want to play a game? You want to play a game with yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? No, 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 no. Yes? Yes. Okay, guess what I have. Oh my gosh. <gasps> yes, oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so we're seeing some things. Joy, mom is modeling and really connecting. Yeah, they're so engaged, right? Okay. Way more modeling, way more communicative functions. Not using a device with instruction, right? This natural. Totally. Yeah, pausing. Mm -hmm. They're using expectant pausing. Excellent. Okay. Well, listen, guys, we have, we're just down to the wire. If anybody else has any other questions, uh, we'll put our email up in a second. But we do also have a two-day uh, s'mores program um, coming up. And because we know that it's hard to read a research paper and then implement the program with Fidelity in the classroom, right? That's why we provide a complete toolkit with our s'mores trainings, which include a manual with all the necessary forms and training materials, slideshows and Google and PowerPoint formats, as well as a DVD. Um, and so for more information, you guys can use the link here. Here's just different ways to contact us. I know like you might have like questions additionally. Um, please reach out via email to us or on Twitter. Uh, I know even in the school-based systems, if you have questions on how we start incorporating some of the same stuff as much as we can in the schools, let us know. We'd love to hear. Yeah, reprints of our school study are available if you email us. They're just they're not open source. But um, you are so welcome. Thank you Lisa, all it's for not, it's, attending. And just so you guys know that the s'mores training, it's um, going to be hybrid. So you don't have to live in Chicago to come. I know Alyssa just said that. We've had people all over the world attend. So um, it will be remote as well as in person. So I want to say thank you to both of you. That was a, a action-packed and information-packed uh, presentation. I think we've got a whole lot of uh, basic information that will help us um, move forward as we think about communication partners. And and um, I hope um, people get a chance to uh, take a look at your website because I know it's really full of wonderful stuff, including that uh, sign up for the uh, for this more training. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much for having us.